Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 81st New Social Environment. Um, I'm Malva Kajali, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation with artists Carrie Moyer and Sheila Pepe, hosted by our favorite Yassi Alipur. Uh, we're also thrilled to have the poet Biswamit Thwibedi here, who will be giving us an extra special treat. He will be here to read a few poems to close today's program. Um, very excited for that. Um, and now to introduce today's host, Yassi Alipur is an Iranian artist, writer, thinker, and folder who currently lives in Brooklyn and works on topics of paper, politics, and performance. She teaches at Columbia University, SVA, and is also currently a resident at the Sharp Valentis studio. Yassi is also a dearly beloved contributor to the rail. Um, Yassi, take it away. Great. Um, well, first of all, thank you to everyone for coming in. Um, I wanted to start today uh, with yet another kind of a heavy news that hit recently. Um, it's interesting. I was in um, talking to Sheila and Carrie two days ago, and then all of this happened afterwards. I wanted to start with like a brief note that is kind of personal to me. Hopefully, as most of you know, uh, the ICE recently uh, published a new policy that could potentially, uh, very realistically, um, result in deportation of millions of international students um, in the in United States. Um, I say it's personal to me. I'm someone who has came to the city with that visa. I came to the rail with, with that visa. I kind of want to bring it back and kind of talk about it in relationship to our very, our own corner of the world. Um, specifically, I wanna talk about the international art scene um, of the States and especially New York. Um, it's been hard, this, this um, administration has been attacking the international community for years now. Uh, I've, I've seen friends leave, I've seen the scene change, I've seen inaction when it comes to the art world. Hopefully the institutions will stand by their students at this moment, but, and there are different petitions going on. I think it's important to make calls right now, but the reality of it is as someone who has been an international student in this city and has been a teacher to international students, I must say the problem is bigger. I've seen the racism towards international students as a student and I've seen it as a teacher. And I just want to say, I don't think the New York art scene will be worth anything if it's not for the international community. And it's hypocritical to call it an international scene if we don't support the international artists. Um, and then to kind of wrap that thought up, I also want to emphasize that most of the international artists and students are people of color. They also don't have legal rights in this country. They're prosecuted by the law, but they can't change the law. So it's very much on the citizens and people who have hold power to help them exist within this context. Um, I guess that's a heavy start, but I guess that's also where we are. Um, I can't uh, imagine um, more inspiring and better people to talk to right now. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about how to do this intro there's obviously all the lists that I can go through. Um, Carrie and Sheila have been significant artists for a really long time. As all of you know, Carrie Moyer is a painter and a writer. Um, her paintings have appeared in numerous exhibitions around the world, including the Whitney Biennial. Um, she's also an activist and an educator. Um, Sheila is a uh, something I love about her is like any description of her work is wrong. She's a sculptor or an installation artist or none of it and all of it. She's a maker. She's been my educator. She's an activist. Uh, but more than that, when I think about this introduction or why it really matters to me to have this conversation, I think about a, something that comes up with both Sheila and Carrie talking about like their history, especially uh, with the art world and a moment in the East Coast where being lesbian artists meant invisibility, uh, meant an erasure in history, 
and mental oppression. And I think that's something that a lot of, a lot of us still feel uh, until now. And then there's 30 years of their practice uh, where they formed and reclaimed and carved new histories uh, when they made collaboration and education um, and activism possible. Um, so it's, it's an honor to have them here. Um, and I can't thank them enough for accepting this invitation. With that, uh, please join me to welcome Sheila and Carrie. <laughs> That was my brief oh, intro monologue. Lovely. We are just so delighted to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And to be talking to you in particular. Yes, it's true. <laughs> I'm like, it's too soon for me to get way too emotional. Um, <laughs> I'm going to jump in because I have a million questions Good. for you. Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask you, and it's, it's related to what I just said, but something that has been very significant for me personally um, has been your relationship with history and how you engage with history in different ways in both of your practices. Um, Carrie, I think something that is, has been very important in your practice for artists, especially artists like me and my generation, is how in your paintings you deal with like so many different corners of art history, like can be feminism, it can be abex, it can be like you take and you combine and you create a new space, uh, which is kind of a hard lesson still, uh, like a, <laughs> something that I always battle. And um, Sheila, I've been really interested in your relationship to history. I recently came upon this short talk you gave um, at the Met and it was a tour of the armors and you were looking at the objects and there's a point where you look at the material and you s talk about how you can see the hand of the maker. Yeah. Um, and with that, you can have a conversation. And it was interesting because you also mentioned that it's like, of course, the space is very much about patriarchy, but what it means to reclaim it, uh, to have that conversation. So since we started this dialogue about invisibility, erasure and oppression, I wanted to hear both of your thoughts on history and how it comes to your practice? Ooh. Wow. Do you want to go first? <laughs> um, okay. I mean, I think, you know, I'm, I will try to hit the points you talked about, Yasi, but history has been such an important aspect to my work and to thinking about how to make art. Um, I, and, and this is a very common thing that might get said in a room full of painters, which is that you're, you're talking to people behind you, but you're also talking to people in front of you. So it's like, what is the, um, what is the discourse and what do you want to take from these historical modes that have, have left people like me out of them, you know, and how do I reinvent them? Um, and we're also in this moment of the, you know, the internet and what that has done to something like painting, which is it's made everything accessible in a way that is a kind of cut and paste, you know, today I'm going to talk about Donald Judd, tomorrow I'll talk about so and so, you know, it's much of, it feels like often work is about how much research a person did rather than trying to invent something out of these different confluences of history. So that's been one way I've dealt with it in the painting side, but also in the graphic and agitprop side. Um, Dyke Action Machine was very dedicated to sort of returning to um, different modes of public communication, be they like revenge films or WPA posters or brides magazine advertisements. Um, and these will come up eventually in the, yeah, there we go. So, you know, one of the things that my partner and I, Sue Schaffner, were really interested in is actually mining kind of the public understanding of what each of these formats did to the viewer, what they signaled. And since all of this work was on the street, we were very interested in using 
a kind of recognizable and easily accessible language to put images out in the world that hadn't been seen yet. Um, at the time in the early 90s, there really weren't any um, images of women who looked like what people thought lesbians looked like at the time. And uh, now this is, a, you know, seeped into culture, but it was a form of visual representation that really wasn't part of the mainstream. So it was important to have these pictures out on the street. If you could show the next slide, that'd be great. I think they're, yeah. So for example, this one riffs on a Lester Beale poster for the WPA. I think it was like 1937 where they were, it was um, a dam, I think it was for a dam in like Kentucky or something. Um, so each of the works that we did really talk to a certain um, historical moment. And in this case, we were really interested in how patriotism was being used as a way to get gay people to be consumers. So, and I'll let Sheila jump in there. So, um, I mean, from a very personal point of view, my relationship to history has very much to do with my like lifelong desire to know where I came from. Because I think as, because my grandparents came from Southern Italy, that's as far as we know. I knew up to my grandparents and then that was it. And then everything dropped off. Um, and that, you know, I was sort of brought up with this idea of art being something that was, if you wanted to do it, you wanted to be in history, otherwise go home. You know, it was just this idea of you wanted to participate at this level of influence and dialogue and that it had very much to do with self-reflection and interaction with the world you live in. And know that, you know, history and particularly art history was always going to be a false narrative because it's made by patriarchy, um, but also because it's made by humans and there's no way to know what, there's no way to know a hundred years ago what we know today. Mm. So I was, I was educated as a grad student 10 years later than an undergrad. And so I encountered the kind of canonical postmodernism in the early 90s as a kind of entree into a digital world that would turn everything into a super surface. Mm. Mm. So I was already skeptical of all of those clearly um, uh, the, 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 the set of theorists that we were being given as artists was a microcosm, was it was a small part of all of the philosophy one could imagine, not just in Europe, but around the world. So I was already mm -hmm. skeptical of what wasn't there. Um, so uh, art history, art history, the person, the environment, the citizen is very classical kind of Western idea of progress and the evolution of an artist. And I was taught that when you were, you got good when you were old. Mm. And so even as a young lesbian, I hung out with a lot of women who were at least 10 or 15 years or more older than myself. So we could learn what it was, this thing, this culture we were doing. Mm. So it was like much older, we're very cross generational. Um, but I think my really intense last number of years, um, when I knew you in school and before I knew it, I think I would say since 1913, uh, 1913, <laughs> since 1913, so old. Um, since 2013, my summer at Skowhegan, when um, there was a crisis in the community around the Trayvon Martin verdict. Um, there were, it was a very international group that I loved, um, but I quickly was very aware that I knew, I didn't know enough to be a mentor or a teacher for these people because I didn't, mm -hmm. my own education was missing huge gaps. 
And so I started working on American history, on world history. Mm -hmm. Actually, I started with some American history and uh, Chinese history right away because that was important. And also because in my era, you learned no Chinese or Russian history as a, yes. because they were communist and they didn't exist. So yeah. I started filling in the gaps in the, and it's through wanting to be a better participant as a critic or as a viewer yeah. that I realized I couldn't address culture unless I knew more. Yeah. Um, Interesting. I think I, I mentioned this the other day, um, but yeah, as, as your student, I, I remember our passionate conversations about history. Or yeah. I remember, like, I was thinking about it the other day. I remember you leaving my studio and you were like, Yasi, can you be proud of your history as an Iranian? I was like, well, I don't know. Pride is tricky. Uh, but even like that kind of a conversation, I mentioned this because Carrie, like something that it, for me feels really important in your work too is like something that is perhaps the hardest lesson I learned in like post-colonial theory. It's like it's one thing to have an anti-colonial movement, but then how do we create new discourse or new conversation when we do borrow from these problematic and oppressive histories? It's like, what do we do with all the theory and like the modernity that was colonialism? How do we engage with Marx while recognizing that he was definitely racist? I, I wonder if there are some Marxists on, in the audience that will get mad about that. <laughs> <laughs> they always have. And they always... I, just, I, I can just go on the record and think, he's a jerk, okay? I just think he's a total jerk. Jill, you're going to get us in trouble. I know. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, but the same is true for patriarchy. And I think there, there's something about how both of you engaged with what do we do with a history that has been erased, the history that isn't written, the, the history that is kind of like hidden under bodies that were oppressed, and histories that are problematic, but we inherit it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that, oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm very talkative. No, I was going to say that to me, the, the really important part that keeps that feels like it's getting left out of a lot of conversations right now is that, especially amongst artists and younger artists, it's like, yes, there's a strong desire to learn other histories and to learn histories that haven't been um, either hidden or written about. But the fact is we're all sort of inculcated into this system and what do we do with it? Yeah beyond critiquing it. Like critiquing it is incredibly important, but how do we actually use it to move forward? And I think like for me, I, you know, this painting that's on the screen right now, I was, I had taken a break in my own work to do Dyke Action Machine basically full time. And I came back to painting in the early 2000s. And I was thinking about what is, you know, what would this sort of idea of a feminist prehistory look like? Because when I was an art student, I always wanted to like, I was always looking at books about like goddess worship. And I mean, that was the eighties and that was, like, wow. and, but um, so part of my studio practice was this sort of fantasy world in which I imagined what a feminist prehistory would look like. Um, and of course, that relies on all of the, my own interpretation of things like color field painting. Mm -hmm. What is color field painting? It's this viscous liquid that is um, very bodily. And, you know, it has all these associations that were not part of the original package, but then could be re- you know, reutilize. And of course, many people have done things like this since. Um, I'm not saying I'm the first person, but it's thinking about how these modes of production and modes, really modes of understanding of how processes operate in the mm -hmm. studio. Like, what do we do with that? So let me tag on to that. Find, find an object in there that I made. We can talk about it. The thing is, is that 
I, when Yasi, when you, you're talking about this, I realize that there are a couple of big differences between, and I, I would attribute to both the, the digitization of, of our world and also um, years of experience. So, um, Tyler, can we get uh, one of Sheila's works on the screen? Thank you. There you go. So, um, there's, you know, when one is focused on the role of the artist as like a decision maker who's mm -hmm. wanting to put something out into the world um, that takes up new space, mm -hmm. that's all. And by design, we'll then um, describe a location or say something that hasn't been said before. I think that was the, that was the mm -hmm. formula for being a part of history, right? Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that it would take time. I mean, when I first met Carrie, we would have these wonderful conversation arguments about how it's in part our job to educate our audience about what the work is, because it would be a rec it would not be completely recognizable to the initial audience, mm. because if it was recognizable, it would be old. Mm. That's changed. Perfect recognizability is the name of the game because of the speed of all of this. And because not only are we seeing the first work made, we're seeing inside the studio of the work being made, mm. which is completely unprecedented and mm. incredibly impatient. Mm. And so the, the idea of making a mark and being part of the conversation has also changed dramatically. It's not a, it's not a function of time or evolution or digestion. Mm. It's a function of, um, and so, so when people say decolonize this, I'm like, oh, what time is it? Tomorrow morning? You say, make the list, we're gonna do it. And this is completely antithetical to how I understand human relationships are. It's mm. not a meme, yeah. it's not a list. It's, mm. it's, um, mm. it's, a, it's a new taking of space and understanding what the impact of Mm. will be on all humans um, on the planet. Right. So, so this is my way of making something that I know to be a hidden part of, at the time I'm making a more hidden part of my identity that is not on mm. the table, my Catholicism, mm. I'm making small objects in a variety of modernist forms in a methodology that is as simple as possible, like mm. craft and child craft. Um, and also I know that all of my local, either the crocheting, the lesbian identified, the women's work, it's like a, it's like a Russian dolls, many Russian dolls of um, association that mm. get seen over time because mm. I will have to go around the, the country and show you picture of my lesbian friends and their crocheting or their, you know, I will have to place the culture that I'm coming from on the table because mm. it doesn't exist anywhere except for in pockets. I mean, that's what mm. Carrie, and so Carrie and I will have conversations about lesbians still being invisible because they are being defined by a certain group of West Coast people mm. in Hollywood, for example, mm. <laughs> or, you know, it's, they, they, they're they still coming, but you have something like, um, uh, uh, some uh, character on TV that is at least 30 years old, but placed in a space that is uh, today, and mm. using gender language of today, like, for example, mm. Here's an interesting historical note on, on one of the social platforms. I saw somebody, they, someone who was lived in the 1950s. It's like, mm. I don't think so. It's like right. 80s lesbians calling Boston marriages lesbians. It's like, no, right. we didn't really know. Right. I mean, it's, that's, I mean, I'm like, I knew I would have a million questions for you. That's also interesting because I feel like even people like Jack Halberstam really emphasize like 
do not erase a history by using the language of today to the past. This is no longer about self-identification. It's yeah. just another kind of erasure. Um, I say this in each interview and people have told me that I could, should just stop, but I don't. I'm really bad at segues. Um, but okay. I also wanted to think about, it kind of came up uh, with what you were both saying, but think about your own histories too. Uh, Sheila, you often talk about your personal history, kind of yeah. like what it meant to grow up Catholic, but also in a church that was like very engaged with the civil rights movements. Uh, but also the different figures in your lineage that de dealt with craft. So you talk about kind of your own body in your parents' deli, doing labor, but also playing, but also learning what labor is. Yeah. Um, learning how to do crochet from your mom or your relationship to your grandfather who was a cobbler. Um, and I think that's very present in your work and your gestures. Um, and Carrie, I, I noticed this somewhere and I thought, I'm always curious when it comes up, but it was, I thought it was interesting that you often mentioned that your parents were very much like hippies and active. And at one point you mentioned that like as a teenager, you were like, there was this moment where I was handed Mao's Red Book. I'm always like <laughs> fascinated by how the Red Book comes in, especially in the 70s. Um, but that iconography becomes so core to your work too. Um, thinking about like the graphic design uh, of the left. Um, I, this is kind of just um, taking a moment to kind of thinking about your context, but also how it spoke to your work and your relationship to politics and activism. I don't like that word. <laughs> <laughs> For me, the, the, um, the breakthrough and, you know, people who have heard me speak before will recognize this. It was when I was, I was a grad student at Bard and at a certain point, I don't remember what visiting artist said this to me, but there was some conversation about the fact that I had created this very rigid barrier between private studio practice, which was, you know, painting, which was what I was trained in and the stuff that I did in my day job, which was I worked at very big ad agencies for many years. Um, and is there some intersection there? And that sort of began this investigation in the painting where I was thinking about how do these um, symbols that are actually very much embedded in a particular time, although we do see this sometimes, it was on um, Robin Morgan's book cover, Sisterhood mm -hmm. is Powerful. Uh, which was a big book when in the 70s. I was born in 1960. So, um, and it's like, what does this material look like in a painting? Because one of the arguments for abstraction is it's, at least when I was coming up as an artist, was this like sense of like timelessness. In other words, you wouldn't want to make history paintings or you wouldn't want to make representational paintings, because once that moment was over, who cared about it, right? Um, which of course is false, but I think that was kind of the, you know, the message that I internalized. So I was sort of trying to play back and forth between making agitprop and then seeing how some of that stuff functioned inside the realm of painting. Um, <laughs> yeah. So jump in, Sheila. Well, I mean, I think that we both are making our early work is in a realm of um, hybridization that's either manual or conceptual, mm. right? It's when um, the digits are still these things. Mm. And, um, and also the only way to find a place in culture is by um, reusing the references that you come from, but also doing it in such a way that um, now I call it, uh, when I teach, I call it your own internal intersectionality, right? 
in the, in the 90s, it was Homer Baba talking about shuttling in location, mm -hmm. um, mm. which I think is a, a much more lovely way to think about it because it's the body in motion, especially now when I can do this and see all the, how many, 108 faces or screens here and say, well, that's, that's how it works now. It's all, I'm mm. sitting on my butt and I'm seeing all this variety, but um, mm. it, it's um, carving out that space. And it was also less populated time was mm. really important. And making what we'd call elbow room, just creating a space mm. for ourselves to be seen. Mm. Um, a lot of these tactics have become somewhat ubiquitous in to, to such a degree that it, you can't even see any history in the work or you can see so mm. much history in the work that it's it's a what it's like extremely um it's not very multivalent you know mm. or there's or it's so discursive right. yeah it's like well i don't know what this is attached to so mm. we're both materialists and we're both um, formalists and um, there mm. and we're both I think believe that form is always political because that's what we have mm. but it's for me um, and I would guess for Carrie there's always a consciousness that we're working with forms we did not invent mm. forms that we've mm. inherited and forms that don't include us mm. um, and I think one of the things that's happening now for me is really trying to um, bear down on the parts of the um, forms, the languages that do include me, that I have assimilated, the white mm. forms, the the Roman forms that are now like part of, literally part of my history, but also the really kind of gross use of uh, romantic Roman tropes that made America that are mm. completely ridiculous. So that kind of history is ties together the kinds of things I'm making that even to me at the moment seem somewhat normal or obdurate. Mm. Um, and what I eventually expect to find out from this work as I make it, that makes sense. So I'm in my mm. own kind of, um, I have the privilege of being in my own somewhat unknown territory with my own work. Mm. Mm. Uh, and it's I think that's, it's very uh, like history affirming, like that this mm. will keep going on and whether or not I'm inside of the, the, any kind of canon, it doesn't matter because I'm not in control of that. Mm. I was just thinking it's interesting, something that really stood out to me and I think it's present in both of your work. Uh, but Sheila, there was this talk you gave, and I think it was like a moment in a Q&A. Um, but at one moment, you were talking about how you find the term um, the, the social sculpture uh, yeah. to be absurd a bit, because any moment when there's an object in space, it's already social, there's already politics. So if there can be that separation, and Carrie, you just mentioned this, but I've been really taken by kind of moving beyond the notion that abstraction is somehow uh, beyond history and is somehow universal and thinking about it as a language. Because um, with that, politically and socially, then it's very different. It carries different potentials and responsibilities. Um, Tyler, can we see one of Sheila's uh, installations? Because I missed them. Uh, <laughs> there, there are a couple in there for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also because they make me think about the relationship to space. Um, yeah. That is somehow for me also related oh, yeah. to the, to thinking about the space of the church too, but also as a space where bodies can gather. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to, it's interesting. I think I've slightly been selfish about this interview, if it's not obvious. Uh, no, I've just been thinking a lot about um, the urgency of this moment and what it means to have this conversation with both of you um, right now. So I wanted to ask you about, uh, you both took some years when you were like, you know what, I'm going to be an activist. 
And what I make is related to activism is kind of separated from the art or the art world. I feel like, and that's like the eighties, early nineties. I feel like once again, we live in a moment where there's like people are on the street, there are things that are happening. There's, it feels like there's too much at stake. Um, so um, Carrie, you already mentioned uh, some stuff about the um, Dyke Action Machine. Uh, and um, Sheila, I'm really curious about uh, the, the years that you were active as an activist. Uh, I was wondering if you guys could introduce uh, what was the 80s and early 90s? Wait, Tyler, can you go back to that one? Thank you. There you go. Um, I'll just sort of, for me, it was, um, I was getting out of undergrad. I went to Pratt. I was establishing a studio. I couldn't figure out how to make money. And I came into, I decided I would try to work in advertising and learned some of the first like standalone computers that they used in ad agencies. Mm. So a lot of the work that I did with Dyke Action Machine and Sue Schaffner was us using all of this equipment at our day jobs. Mm. And for, for us, that was sort of part of the thrill of it because we were, you know, working on things like, um, the Christian Music Club or, you know, cigarettes, marketing cigarettes. And at night we were using all this equipment to do these projects. So, and that was also the same time when ACT UP was active. I was a member of Queer Nation, the Lesbian Avengers. There was a lot of activism that came out of outing notions mm -hmm. of, um, even the term queer, which was supposed to um, join women or lesbians and gay men together under some kind of umbrella, which totally didn't work. Thus the lesbian Avengers. Um, can we see the next slide? So this was a, a, this also, like all of the damn stuff was involved with the, de the de development of like technology and desktop technology. So this was a project that we did when everybody first started going online. And it was a website where you could go to this lesbian planet. Um, and all of these models and um, props and everything were made by us and we would go out. In this case, we went upstate to a park and shot this. So, I mean, Part of my work, well, it hasn't really been my work, it's also been my pleasure, has been mm -hmm. doing different kinds of activism for things like the Irish Lesbian and Gay Organization. I did a lot of stuff for the Avengers. And I, by stuff, I mean graphic design and agitprop. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not somebody who can tolerate like organizing in big groups, so I like to have sort of self-select and, you know, okay, I'm going to make a logo or I'm going to make this or that. Um, so that's how I've sort of found my way through this. Mm -hmm. And then as my painting took off and, I mean, I think one of the things I want to say about this is that um, the art world is so mono-focused that once you're identified with some kind of work, mm. that's the only thing you're allowed to speak on. So one of the ways I've tried to shift is, you know, by re-embrace, or tried to shift rather, was by re-embracing painting and mm. my sort of childhood love of abstract painting. So it's like, but that took a long time because for a number of years I was seen as a queer activist. Hmm. Um, Carrie, can can I just add though that um, I think one of the last things you did was a a button that that Dyke Action Machine did was a button for the first uh, George W. Bush campaign, and it was it had a double axe and it said, "Run, Bush, run! The lesbians are coming." So it had turned to not, it had turned to like lesbians being a part of the culture already and being ironically scary because mm. two things happened in the interim. Ellen was on TV. 
lesbians were getting marketed to, which is, yeah. Car you know, Carrie's whole thing about like watching who gets marketed to and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And the streets of New York started shutting down the wallpaper pasting technique that Dyke Action Machine was mm -hmm. using. Mm -hmm. So the streets started getting cleaned up for the tourists. Mm -hmm. So this entire shift and like, and I think that I remember thinking this is brilliant the Dyke Action Machine saw that their project had become somewhat obsolete mm. and mm. said, we're going to stop for a while, which I think is what, mm. why it's activism and not necessarily art, because it's speaking mm. to a moment. It's not perpetuating a, a, a thing in order to perpetuate it. It had a real mm. a political function. Mm. Mm. And I think that's why obsolescence is a completely underrated um, thing. When things change, we must change our mm. position. Mm. I mean, that's why. Yeah, show your, Tyler, can you show the next one? Yeah. Because this sort of segues into Sheila's version yeah. of this. So I, you know, I left home at 17, went to an all women's Catholic college because that was where I was literally allowed to go to an all women's Catholic college. Mm. Um, got a pretty good education, then went to two more years at Mass Art and studied ceramics. And when I got to Boston, I was far enough away to come out. Mm. It came out like gangbusters. I was like totally homophobic and then I was out. I was like, I'm not a lesbian. <laughs> that would be awful. Oh, I love you. <laughs> so, um, and then it all started coming out in the, in the ceramics and I started, you know, and I was also really hungry for all the hand stuff. So I learned every mm -hmm. kiln in the shed and made all these clay bodies and I was just totally a clay head and immersed in it. And by time I left school, I was like, I lived in a lesbian house that might as well have been an Alison Bechtel comic strip. I then worked in a lesbian restaurant. I was hanging out with women who were much older than I was, who were, they didn't say we're separatists, but they were separatists mm. and varying degrees. Um, but the idea was we want a place to work. We want it for ourselves. The landlady was a landlady. It was originally um, a collective that failed, which is another mm. typical story. Um, so there were two women who, one was an artist who really wanted not to work in a restaurant anymore. And so at the end, it was just one woman who was the owner and we all worked there. Um, and it was women only, right? It was lesbian only. Okay. I mean, it was, and it was very, um, like the telephone in the place was the pay phone. Um, the way you made co phone calls was there was a big, um, bowl of dimes near the phone and you use that this is like an old school way of not having to pay for a landline because you can mm. get calls in <laughs> there are all these what we would now call hacks like that and the neighbors thought that it was a punk rock restaurant i mean every it was every projection under the sun about what this restaurant was but it was ours and we made food we wanted. We had, you know, hundred grade A beef and scrambled tofu. It was almost kosher. Like, and these pots are for the tofu and these are for the beef. No Coca-Cola, no soda. There was like a hundred different frontier um, teas. Raspberry is my favorite because it's very fluffy. <laughs> I didn't know what it tastes like, but it was fluffy. And we would like take time and have a you know, philosophical conversation in the kitchen during a lunch rush because we wanted to play music really Nina Hagen at the top of her lungs because we wanted to and if people didn't like it they didn't have to and there was always it was like everybody was welcome men on dates women on dates men and women on dates beautiful um trans fairies reading Mary Daly at the counter I mean it was just like <laughs> you do not see yourself out there and you like this place that's fine um, so it's very idealistic and it didn't, la and it didn't last very long. Mm. But you know, it's, it's yeah. so interesting. Um, 
Sheila, when you were talking about Carrie's work, um, and this moment of like activism to like suddenly becoming consumers, I constantly think about how like power history and erasure works. And I think part of it is like, you're accepted and within that a very normative narrative of what your history is can exist within that. It's like suddenly there's a normative narrative of what is the history of like lesbians in the East Coast. And if you're not within it, then you're completely invisible. I, I thought it was interesting to then think about the generational conversations you had at Beatles lunch. And one of the reasons why I think it's really important for my generation right now to have the, these conversations with yeah. you, because I'm always taking, I'm like all these moments of activism and like political dreams that kind of totally failed, but like actions that happen were happening in New York in the eighties by people who I know but I never knew that. Like, I never knew any of these things were happening because they're not yes. within the textbooks. That's right. Um, not yet. Not yet. But I also think <laughs> there's, when I was here and Carrie was working her day job, this, mm. the possibility to have this conversation was completely aspirational. Mm. Right? Mm. We didn't know. We wanted, or actually then, I just wanted to burn down patriarchy and fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and fuck the art world because I could tell yeah. there was no place for me. Hmm. But I think there's a difference and and you know that's really apparent between the restaurant and the you know wheat pasting posters that are up for three weeks at a time hmm. which is that you know one thing that we have have totally lost is the idea of ephemeral culture when I was um, younger and I lived in the East Village, that was how people communicated. They put posters mm. up and, you know, and it's like now everything's an archive. They're making archives of Black Lives Matter posters. They're, you know, so it's, it, it to me, it loses, it's not, I'm not against this, but there's something very vital about mm the fact that a marginalized group would communicate in a way that is very transitory. Mm. Um, and that's mm. something that the internet has erased forever. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's erased but amplified because it's all getting recorded, but no mm. one will be able to take it all in. <laughs> so I mean, it will still get prioritized. Yeah, it's interesting, um, Carrie, what you said really made me, th I've always been fascinated by this, but the, within the history of Iran, when the revolution, like the 79 revolution was happening, there was a lot about prints. Right. Prints and copying cassettes and like handing it to people or wheat pasting mm -hmm. to the point that having a Xerox machine was like a big crime. It was a big no-no. Oh, yeah. um, it's like, I always imagine the smuggled underground Xerox machines because they're <laughs> that small That's so and in great. our time when we were protesting it was like facebook it was right. um and and we managed to communicate much faster but the problem was like everyone knew so the police was always there before we were right it was just online but the other thing that for me has been kind of terrifying is like from the protests in iran it's like now it's been more than 10 years and the other day i was trying to search it and you no longer can find it because there's so much information that piled up on top of it. Yeah. So it, it is somewhere within this giant world, uh, but you can't access it anymore. Um, mm. But to think about materiality and kind of come back, um, Chile, I love this image. Um, <laughs> you sometimes talk about how you made this kind of a plan for the menu so they could just be there and be used and no one used them. But I also love it because it speaks to your practice in a really yeah. weird way. This is a really good example of um, foreshadowing. Ha ha. It's a joke. <laughs> um, that you, that there are things that you, there are things that you use that make sense to you and you really don't know why and then you pick them up in new contexts and, um, and you, and if you happen to take, I was very proud of these. I thought this is a great invention. Um, but of course, I, I love this. I kept this, and this is originally a slide, right? Mm. Because it's, I thought it was also beautiful as its own mm. thing. Um, Tyler, can you 
keep moving forward now? Yeah. Just, Thank yeah. You. Okay, there you go. It even has the shadows that you constantly worked with. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I feel like the, as you both kind of return to um, your studio practice, um, a lot of those years kind of come in with like the elements you use, the material, or even the questions that were there. Um, my next question is kind of like really vague and big, but I guess that's how my brain functions. I wanted to ask you about the body and language in both of your work. And that feels really deep and key in different ways in your practice. But yeah, any thoughts on the body and language? <laughs> uh wow i mean i i for me i think that's where um humor comes in which is part of something that sheila and i share a lot because we you know to be really like three-year-old about it it's like ooh, a funny shape like even this one that's on the screen right now sock folder it's like that is like so ridiculous, but wouldn't that be a cool thing to have? Um, so I think, you know, for me, the body in terms of the paintings operates in many ways. One is that I'm literally like moving around the canvas. The canvas is off, often on the floor because I'm pouring and, or not on the floor, excuse me, on a table. So this sort of relationship between it being horizontal and being vertical and it being this thing that's pretty unwieldy. Often it's hard for me to sort of move them around because they're already stretched. Hmm. Um, is, you know, it's this like critical part of the process and one of the moments or multiple moments in each painting that I kind of wait for is the, um, the kind of, you know, this is very old fashioned like painting language, like the trance part. It's like, okay, no phone calls, no audio books, no NPR, total quiet and just all of my tools are at hand and I'm gonna live through this thing as long as it takes. Um, and that feels like, something that sounds really dumb from the outside, but is very, very profound when it's happening in the studio. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I come from a dance background and more recently I've been trying to like connect these two mm -hmm. aspects of how movement works in the paintings. Mm -hmm. Sheila, you want to take over or? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm thinking about <laughs> Carrie's practice and how um, it's funny how muscular it is when she's mm. moving these big things mm. around and in a, in a space that is just big enough to handle the my simultaneous. I'm, um, I, I have to say one of the things that Carrie and I bonded over when we first met was this idea of work ethic. Mm. I've got the Italian peasant version. She's got the Lutheran version. And we found a cross link culturally where mm. it, like your value is your work. Mm. And so we also, um, so we wanted to be in the studio all the time. We could be in the studio all the time. This was, a, this was seen as a mutual benefit. Um, and the way I understood it coming up was I was doing something that wasn't hard enough work because I was having too much fun. Hmm. So I had to work extra hard. And there are all kinds of very, um, what I would say now are popular ideas uh, that, that were the feminist theory in the 70s and 80s, but I felt it didn't ever, it was, it was like a, you know, one of those brambles you get on your socks mm. and somebody just kept kicking that feminist piece off and I would have to go and put it back on your socks again. 
And so I've been forming the same story about lesbian feminism since I was two or something. So that it's, so it's more than a bramble that sits on your sock. So mm. the labor part of it is part of the mm. class stuff, the, the, mm. Um, mm. the um, it's also how I became American and also how I became white through mm. this avenue of uh, almost like a Puritan work ethic. Mm. Um, mm. But, and through this idea of women's work and feminist ideas. So I, there was a lot of the message that I thought was extremely rudimentary, but also necessary both inside the art world as well as outside the art world. And this idea of holding on to both audiences was tricky. Mm psychological place for me. Mm. Um, that said, um, with sculpture, there's, with sculpture, the body's always present, both the maker's body and the mm. viewer's body. Mm. And I have to say, there's not, I, maybe I'm not reading the right things or reading enough, but I don't, I'm not understand, I do not, I feel like, a, so much art is being seen and read as image process, maybe materials, but not the sculptural, the kind of post uh, freed kind of uh, reading of, you know, his diss of sculpture being a, a place of performance, hmm. which is a place of performance, hmm. gets missed. And there's mm. that you always project your body into, around, through mm. the object. It either, it's always in relationship to social space it, it, on a continuum. Um, either not social, in private space, mm. domestic space, institutional space. And so, for example, my reading of Dyke Action Machine is that one of the biggest parts of it was not only infiltrating as sculpture, infiltrating public space as posters, but it was infiltrating, infiltrating privatized corporate space because mm. they were using all their stuff, mm. right? So for me, it was um, bringing girly monumental stuff to the museum. And once that became... Uh, the fairly ubiquitous practice pretty quickly, well, also already was happening, but once the, the knitting, the crocheting suddenly whoop, was everywhere, then it was what kind of architecture, what kind of space, what kind mm. of color story, what kind of impediment, um, how do I get other people involved? So each piece becomes a different learning mm. process for me. Um, mm. Some of it not completely successful work, some of it mm. more successful. So this latest piece that you're showing in terms of the body is really the two things going on. One is it's on a pedestal because it's like, I don't want you to kneel on this, but we do want you to sit on those chairs over there. So that's a mm. simple cue. Mm. And two is, this is nothing like I've ever made in public before. Mm. So that's good my mind because now mm. I'm completely embarrassed by the fact that it might not be that great but I want to show you something that is extremely familiar to me mm. calls up huge questions about religion in general right and you um, say it is Sheila oh so it's a kneeler um common in the Roman Catholic Church and other denominations um but it is a place that I grew I, every Saturday, every Friday night and Sunday morning, the Friday night for, to wait for confession, you know, Sunday at the church. I knelt at this and we were all mm. taught how to hold our hands. When you're little, you hold your hands like this. Then mm. when you want to pretend you're your dad, you go like this, you do the man fold. Like <laughs> there are all these cultural things that are wrapped around this. And then for other people, it is still like a very strange item like what the hell is mm. that and what do I do with it so I think a lot about religion as it mm. flows through all of the issues that we're looking at today around mm. race and mm. institutional and what we think and the fiction of the, of the separation of church and state in the United mm. States and just a raft of 
things that the the mm -hmm. um, power of the black church and mm -hmm. what that means and how do I understand that and so mm -hmm. I've become in all of my history learning in my, all my history studies I be, become a bona fide atheist which is really alarming but a deep cultural Roman Catholic right hmm. um, and so and also have a very long view about the codes of art making being about belief systems and death. <laughs> Julie, you're bringing in death? Yeah. <laughs> right. No, when you look at the really, really long history, yeah. of, it's, there's, it's a lot about burying your armament with you mm. in your grave. Mm or putting these beaker bowls that are coming mm. from the continent to England in your graves, or mm. people getting Kital Huyuk, where some of my people I think are from, where you're <laughs> burying your ancestors underneath the place you sleep mm. with their mm. grave goods. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna, because yeah. uh, I have a million questions. Yeah. Uh, Tyler, can we go back to the uh, first installation shot that had the information about the exhibition? It's a great moment for me to mention. I'm so excited for this to come to the city, even though we have to wait for uh, another six months. Uh, Carrie and Sheila have uh, their amazing collaborative exhibition traveling now. Um, it's called Tabernacles for Trying Times. Uh, this piece that we're looking at, which is a total collaboration, is called Parlor for the People, uh, which is hopefully when the museum is open again and we can commune as people with bodies again. Actually, uh, sorry to interrupt. No, 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 no. The, PM, the Portland Museum of Art is now open. Oh, great. The date that we put for the closing is actually a little later. It's August 16th. So if anybody is going to Portland, they, I think they're letting in like 40 people at a time to the museum. And your tickets are time stamped, yeah. I believe. Uh, okay, that's great. That's well, great. Um, it's, a, but it's, a, um, it's a very large show and we each have quite a bit of work in it that spans individual work and then collaborative work. Um, and it's, it's interesting. I want to kind of step back. Um, there was a moment where I think you were talking about uh, what you bonded over and uh, the idea of work and humor. And I don't know why, not that I know. Uh, but that makes me think about the two of you meeting during Skohegan, because I feel like that's a space where these things can be possible. Least from would have heard from my like my friends. <laughs> but here's the thing: we were not the same year. What? I didn't know that. Did you, yeah. did you meet there? No. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Okay. Okay. We went '94 uh, and went back to visit some friends who worked there, and uh, met Carrie on that visitors' weekend. Oh, that's amazing. And we didn't. She thought I was an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I was acting like a. Yeah, I thought I was invited to her studio. I wasn't. I mean, her friend, our mutual friend invited me to her studio. I didn't know that. And that was very taboo to go to somebody's mm. studio and invite me. So of course I walked in and just started talking as I, about her work. And she just thought, who the hell are you? And so it was from Boston and that's very important. It's kind of like, having Elizabeth Warren walk in your studio before you like Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> and have a like, <laughs> plan for that. And I have a plan for that too. And you should listen to me. <laughs> it all worked no. out. It's 2020. It out. Yeah. Um, but um, I wanted to step back. So for me, it's really interesting. So Carrie, you mentioned the different, even the different verbs when it comes to like making your work. And your body adds, like, I'm interested in that history of you in relationship to dancing mm -hmm. and then how your paintings relate to the body. But also not only in their making, I feel like so much of the experience of how they activate space. Mm -hmm. And I know, like, earlier on, you played with wheat pasting inside the space, too. Um, but also, like, material and details, it's so weird and fascinating that now we're looking at your work through Zoom. Because right. um, I feel like there's so much about material 
And I think that activates the viewer's body. And Sheila, I was thinking about like the body in your work in relationship to labor. It's kind of fascinated about like how these works require people to come together to kind of make it happen, how there's like instructions and it all comes together. Um, and even like in the activation, it's like they kind of activate the architectural space or engage with it or problematize it, mm -hmm. but also they can be interactive with the viewers or even like what they demand from, from the viewer. But then you both also play with the authority of language. Sheila, like in your presentation, sometimes you play with the idea of describing. You suddenly have this like very poetic point where it's like you're going through images and using language to kind of like pinpoint, relate, but also separate. Um, like what happens when these works come in conversation with language? Mm -hmm. But also I think about like how, Carrie, you play with iconography too as, as in relating to language. Um, I think I've been mentioned... always thinking about um, iconography. I mean, that's why the question sometimes for me is whether the work is abstract or representational, because mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in sort of using iconography in a kind of either as a pun or um, something that's a kind of stupid stand in for mm -hmm. sentence or um, and then that for me goes back to the history of things like still life and um, mm -hmm. you know all of the even something like an emoji you know mm -hmm. all of these symbolic languages that we use so freely mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, so that's a very and, and, and in terms of the language in, in the titles, actually, Sheila and I, that is one thing that we have a lot of fun with is that Sheila helps me come up with my titles often. So they, sometimes they are collaborative um, moment of us sort of sitting in my studio and uh, shouting out words and <laughs> looking up definitions and drinking coffee and arguing and She'll tell me what she sees and I'll tell her what I see. Mm. My, what I see is always more flat footed than what Sheila sees. So well, you've been living with it for a lot longer than I have. So I don't, mm. you know, and this is, you know, this is like a surrealist poetry dream. I mean, we are so embedded in, you know, I'll just say it like white Western cultural old school. Um, and we're trying to make it like lesbian and, and I think we're, we're, we're trying to make it different. Um, and we're trying to make it working class. And, mm. and it's also, we're trying to make it with this kind of work. Like, we, mm. like the play part of it, the joy of it, the, I mean, is that we don't have to have different kinds of day jobs. Mm. And so we do spend, and like when I hear Carrie talking about the joy of color or painting or, oh my God, look at this surface. I made this, mm, isn't this a nice, nice surface? This kind of sens sensory pleasure that there's, a, that there's um, room for pleasure and that that's enough. Mm. And a kind of, this is, this is the dream life we're having. I mean, I feel like I'm having my dream life with my dream partner in my dream studio. <laughs> I just knocked on wood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the problem though is that um, to stay as a you know to stay as a participant, not in denial, but in mm. the moment, then it requires constant learning. Mm. And we like that too. Mm. It's beautiful. Um, I forgot what you were saying, what you, what you said, but um, okay. you were talking about language. Yeah, because like there's something about it that for me feels really significantly related to politics. You know, because I feel like the body is like where the urgency is constantly. Like, that's how I think about the experience of being marginalized. It's like constantly reminding yourself that it's like, hey, it's my body on the line. And there's something about like the authority of language discourse and to be able to play with both. I don't know. I think that's why 
I find both of your work to be so moving in all the different ways that they exist. Um, I would be selfish and like continue forever, but I'm going to move on to my last question so we can have our Q and A. Um, and my last question is one of my really vague, big questions, but it is related to everything we talked about. You just mentioned like joy uh, and pleasure and also humor. And I think that's a big part of your work. I'm thinking about this political moment and its urgency. I'm also thinking about your life work. So I guess like, it's a big question to say the least. I was thinking about humor, anger, and mourning mm -hmm. as where we are now, uh, but as your practice. So yeah, any thoughts on those three words? I think this is the right image to be on. Well, these are some um, brand new lines that Sheila helped facilitate for the confronting July 4th of March that was organized by revolting lesbians in honor of Black and Indigenous activists. Thank you, Carrie Moyer. Um, I, but yeah, so we we'll get think, her. Yeah, I think that the morning work, the sad work, is not in here. I didn't give mm. it to you. Mm -hmm. um, that would be the work right after 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Where it's, it's also, I think, kind of beautiful and very ornamental and in that mm -hmm. way, like a little startling, but mm -hmm. definitely like everything goes horizontal, intensely mm -hmm. black and white, um, some drawings that, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I think to be interested in history is a kind of mourning mm. because if you're real about it, you're seeing things that um, you're seeing the fiction constantly. Mm. If you keep digging along with the, the scholarship that's current, mm. you're always learning that what you learned was not true. And you're mm. always grappling with your own epistemology because mm. it's, it's I mean, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about the politics of mourning because of what's happening on the street right now. Mm -hmm. uh, like, how do we think about, actively think about mourning rather than a passive space? But also, of course, like, that's something I think about when I think about ACT UP, but also something I think about when I think about erasure, um, be it the lesbian culture or other marginalized bodies. But then like when I very literally, like for example, with what I started today, um, like talking about the international artists in New York, like very much like my space, there is a lot to mourn. Like my friends left. I, I came here to be among this community that is no longer here. And there's anger. It's like, I feel like with oppression, there comes anger. Um, but there has also been a profound amount of joy, you know, and humor, like that's how we survive. So I've been thinking whether as contradicting as the three terms are, if they can coexist um, and how they have coexisted in your work and throughout your practice over the years as teachers, as activists, as artists. I mean, I think that I'm, um, you know, I'm more interested in joy and pleasure than mourning. Um, I think that, and maybe that's because I, you know, one aspect of my upbringing and personality is like very Midwestern and very optimistic in a sense, even though we're living in really hideous times, um, that's just part of my DNA, I think. Well, I mean, so, not to get too psychological, but Carrie almost died when she was like 18 or 19 years old because mm. she was in this horrible car accident. Mm. So she can get pretty dark. I mean, she has a pretty mm. dark sense of humor and she's also yeah. a New Yorker longer than I am. So like she gets the, she gets a kind of dark New York humor way more than I do because mm. I left New Jersey because it couldn't handle it. Mm. You, know, to, you know, I went to Ernest Land where everything is, there's no, I don't think there's any, is there humor in Boston? I can't remember. <laughs> I mean, I, for me, one of the things about um, 
that I always hated when I was younger was this kind of mourning for New York of the past, hmm. this kind of weird nostalgia thing that I feel like my students are often subjected to by their right. faculty. Yeah. It's like, oh, remember when it was like this or my yeah. studio was $100 a month. <laughs> you know, every generation that's come here in the 20th century has experienced that. And I, and I yeah. don't, um, I always want to get up in those participate in it. Yeah. yeah. I always want to get up in those and say, I'm pretty sure you all were racist and sexist and not kind to my, to my kind. That yeah, just, and just, just a reminder. I mean, the other thing is how many times a day did you get mugged and did you have electricity? Right. And did, could you the get all this, a good cup of coffee? And you know, <laughs> like there are all these, I remember what the subway looked mm. like as a kid. I didn't want to be around that. Mm. Gross. Yeah. It's like the lights off. There's water in the. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm a total bougie. Um, <laughs> like, it's com It's complicated. So, um, I mean, this is the beauty of like how history gets made, right? Hmm. Or doesn't, or gets remade and remade hmm. and remade until somebody wakes up one day and says, "Enough already." Oh, it's been. 200 years, 400 years, and we are like over it. And that's not a long time. Yeah. I mean, it's it for a whole group of people to change their minds about something. Yeah. So. Okay, on that note, uh, shall we open for Q&A? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Malfika's <laughs> like, 400 years, that's not a long time. <laughs> In the scheme of things, um, thank you. Thank you all so much, Sheila, Carrie. Yes, incredible. And like, I'm really glad we've all been muted because I've been giggling. <laughs> um, in the interest of time, our first question comes from the lovely Deanna. Uh, Deanna, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Hello. Thank you so much, Malvika and the Rail and Carrie and Sheila. This is a wonderful conversation. I'm a huge fan of both of your work. I have to say, just I'll try to make this quick. Um, I have so many ideas, uh, things to, to to mention. But one thing is, um, how do you feel, both of you, about the role and the agency of beauty uh, as it plays out in art? or if it ha lacks agency in a role, um, and like, rather who has control of the agency of manipulating beauty, you know, any thoughts along these lines? And also how it relates to like the kind of traditional resistance um, on the part of, of artists who are women to employ too much beauty in their work. Mm -hmm. um, and whether maybe this is a dated idea, or I mean, I know, I mean, as a person who grew up with very influenced by second wave feminism and like sort of like personal is political, like that kind of idea that like the work couldn't be um, too political or it wouldn't be taken seriously or whatever, you know, there are all these dimensions. So I'm just curious if, if you want to just riff on any of that. <laughs> <laughs> Moyer, give, give us a, your riff on beauty and then I'll give you mine. I mean, I think, you know, I'm really interested in beauty um, obviously, but I think that I'm interested in the experience of it through the, through the body in a particular way, like how surfaces or how the tactile affect us. Um, so I know, I mean, I came up in, as a painter during a time when, you know, beauty was very bad. You wouldn't make anything that was beautiful because who would take it seriously? Then I was like an intern at Heresies and learned, was around a lot of feminist artists, like, you know, learning about like Joyce Kozloff and Harmony Hammond and these other relationships to beauty. And then there came Dave Hickey. So in my own lifetime, beauty has been embraced and suspect and um, certainly an object of critique and derision for a, a certain segment of feminist painters or artists in general. But I think 
for me, it's something that keeps me in the studio. And um, at the risk of sounding like a total jerk, I feel like there is something political about it. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, that I'll let Sheila take over from there. But I mean, the, it's, the, a, the, it's the, such a good question because it's so big and complicated. Yeah, and it's it ha it. I don't think we've talked about it enough uh, in the past few years because it. First of all, it's who's beauty because of the cultural construction idea of beauty. Um, for me, I'm always at odds with um, patriarchal, um, heteronormative ideas of beauty, and always at odds with the, uh, the contemporary language of naming gender, because I'm like, yeah, neither one works, and we don't want it to work. Just let us be without any labels, please. Like this one place, just let us be, keep your labels off and none of this can be exact um, on purpose. So you like it that way. It's very pleasurable to enjoy this without language. Um, but for me, I've been consciously trying to embrace things that are not beautiful from the, from the get-go, things that are problematic, like when I started crocheting, ugly, ornamental, tragically Italian, like, and then I, and then I've got this whole mid-century modernist eye that wants to conclude every vista as something like elegantly New Yorker, um, and I think that's the return to New York and being around the architecture and the built structure of New York is a very 20th century idea of beauty in a very American way that is filled with immigrant energy. So it's a very particular moment of, um, you know, when you think about the Lower East Side and there's the Jewish people and then there's the layers of this and that and then the Italians and then the Chinese, like the waves of influence and um, habitation of the city and the workers and who's building the bridges and the tunnels and all that. So, yeah, I have a lot of romance about that because that's when my family came over and they were part of that building. And so I have a kind of relationship to that as a beautiful thing, but it's also incredibly local. Mm. New York is a very local place, unbelievably local place. And so it's wonderful, but it's also has a very dark side to it, I think. So if we want to say beauty and ugliness, the ugly side of New York is the, is the Trump look, is the, um, the um, greed part of it, is the greed is good part of it, is the, um, the worst of the complicity of um, New Yorkers who, <laughs> New Yorkers who were rooting for the South because of the trade on that damn cotton was so good. You know, mm -hmm. that part of it where um, commerce just overtakes everything. And it has its own look. And I think in times that come, people will look at the Trumps and Trump Tower and this kind of Studio 57-ish days as a, a kind of New Yorkism that is- 54. Studio 54. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't even know. I was like, my friends from Jersey were like, we're going to go try to get into Studio 54. And I'm like, that's stupid. You know, that's stupid. It's on TV, so you think it's good. You know, my idea is like, if I stayed in New Jersey, eventually at some point in my life, I would have had to wear lipstick. I would have not been able to get away with, in my immediate family, extended family and social group, I would have not been able to not wear lipstick. And so I had to go. <laughs> so, and that's my feeling about beauty. 
<laughs> I appreciate your answers. I know it's a really huge, wide-ranging, complicated, multi-tentacled kind of issue. Um, but I, 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 I did think it was really interesting that, that Carrie mentioned Jay Picky because I mean, his when his air guitar was published, it was like, whoa, like beauty's okay now, you know. And and I think it's also interesting that, like it was a male writer who did that, like sort of like change the narrative. And, and it, I'm just always thinking about like, who's and in control? Populist. Yeah, yeah, he was definitely populist, for sure. Anyway, I'm, I'm just, thank I could you. go on for a long, long time, but um, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, both of you. Thank you, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you for asking a monumental question. Yeah, I really um, love yeah. those. Can't you it's tell? like it set us off right. Um, our next question, uh, which follows this trend is a bit about history and historicizing the self uh, is from our very own John Capeta, uh, JC. Hi, I think you can say hi guys. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for this conversation. I, it's been great. Um, okay, so my question, that issue of, re of rewriting history. Can you turn up your volume? Because I can't quite hear you. Yes, I will try to speak louder. Thank you. Is that, is that better? Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> Okay, so that issue of rewriting, the issue of rewriting history with today's terminology mm -hmm. is really interesting to me. Because on, on one hand, like, I fully agree that it's an erasure of a person's experience, or it can be. There was that, that recent thing with that image of Lou Reed and Rachel Humphreys, and people were arguing about Rachel's pronouns because people just don't know. And then on the other hand, we see things like Paul Legault translating Emily Dickinson for now, and he made her really gay, which obviously was in the work, but then you get the TV show that comes out of that, and Emily Dickinson is like making out with Susan on the morning of Susan's wedding, which is just almost certainly like not how the relationship. Right. So my question is, how do these impulses to find or create representation of ourselves in a history that wasn't written for us relate to that practice that one of you was talking about earlier of inventing a lesbian prehistory or an alternative history? Mm -hmm. Um, obviously one purports to connect itself to like an, a truth more than the other, but both are kind of fictional exercises and both contain some, some truth. Um, and I guess also, why do we, do either of you have thoughts about why we're not seeing so much of that um, invention of our own histories? It feels like there was so much of it in the 20th century and it's, mm. there's not so much anymore. Yeah. Uh, can I go first? Oh, go ahead. Um, I generally feel like people aren't interested in history. It's like, yeah, but the history, it's all colonial. It's like, well, yes, and, you know, let's face it, let's describe it as best we can. And so I think um, real scholarship requires years of study and um, sitting with the subject for many years. And really um, it requires um, original texts and sources and I mean the kind of scholarship that I believe I inherited in terms of good there's another one from the 90s good is it good is it good or bad right is it quality or not quality I think it I mean we're facing a world with the present where we see what happens when a basic notion of truth breaks down we're not talking about art we're talking about history so this is not art, this is history. And things change as people die. Archives are being made, are, it's not so simultaneous as we are living right now. So we have to reacquaint ourselves with how history actually happens. Like, I don't think we could be in this moment before this moment, because we weren't. It's not like we didn't know this shit was bad. It's just that we couldn't find anybody to really get and then you had to get your job and keep a roof up. You know, like it's things happen, but now that it's there, like, let's go. We're ready. Let's go. So time still is important. And the, the idea about death and when people die and what 400 years is, um, I have that perspective because uh, there are things we call countries now that are thousands of years old. Like Ethiopia, what do you say about Ethiopia? Lucy was born there. That on that, you know, Lucy is, yeah, first bones. Like, what do you say about that kind of time and how we understand the, that story? 
it's going to keep changing because the scholarship changes, but the trend of invention that happens in social media and that's not scholarship. That's just people saying shit. I mean, I think just to go back to um, um, the thing you initially brought up about the, um, you know, inventing a, a lesbian prehistory. Actually, when I made that painting, it was, or the, there's a body of work right there called the Stone Age. Um, I was thinking about how, um, you know, coming out of the second wave feminist movement and being around a lot of older artists and thinking about how important it is for a young person to find these touchstones historically. And that's what we're always, you know, we're surrounded by students who are looking for those things. We were students who were looking for those things. So for me, this, this body of paintings was really about a kind of nexus of what was happening in the art world and in feminism at the time one of those things was this uh, video by Laura Cottingham called Not For Sale, in which she discusses the fact that video art was, is like one of the only art forms that we can truly trace to women makers as being sort of the progenitors of this form. Mm -hmm. um, whereas painting, which is thousands of years old, you know, we can all fantasize about women in caves making paintings of bison, but the sort of factuality of it. And then that was, in my mind, was also in dialogue with the question of the work of someone like Judy Chicago and the dinner party. Like, how did she bring back history? And what does essentialism mean, you know, 20, 30 years after the fact? Um, you know, that's a very much a part of visual discourse right now, but nobody even mentions the word essentialist, but there's like vaginas everywhere. Yeah. So it's like, it's a very weird moment for me as someone who lived through a time in which essentialist work was totally put down yeah. as anti-conceptual and, um, you know, very reductive and so, I guess that's how I would respond to that question. Yeah, I mean, you're right. And not only would, was it um, not good art, it was also politically incredibly incorrect among lesbians and among intellectuals who would call during the culture wars, and Jack recently, one of them who said that essentialist feminists were anti-sex. And I, I would raise my hand and say, no, we weren't anti-sex, we were really into sex. We were just not into porn. Like sex, didn't like porn. But still this is, you know, it's a kind of literally, the instruction is write your own book. So history being made through the scholarship right now will be and should be revised in another 20 years. It just, it's just people will know more about the undocumented spots and people will die and reveal things that they didn't want revealed during their lifetime. I don't know if that will happen for that. Maybe it's all on. You know, we, I remember when Facebook started and realizing that I was only seeing the people that followed me, but I felt like I was the center of the universe for the very first time. And we don't think about that anymore. That's not history. That's an illusion for selling things. <laughs> right, and it even has become so normalized also. Right? Yeah, but it's like every kind of interrogation that has to happen in a, in, to live here consciously on this planet, you know? The tools are significant. The me medium, medium is a message, right? Thank you so much, Jack. I think that was answered. 
Thank you, JC, for your question. Um, and thank you for that wonderful answer. I feel like uh, I'm going to be really greedy here and claim the last question as my own. Um, I, ha I had so many questions I want to ask you. Maybe I'll ask you later, but this is the one that felt sort of essential um, because it is a little simple. Uh, but I wanted to ask you what has been essential to your lives, both of you uh, as artists and as humans. I'm sort of thinking about this idea of like best living conditions, how a lot of the people in my communities are sort of reevaluating what they need in to do things and to be in life. Um, and also kind of thinking about like the joy of allowing yourself to treat yourself like a plant, like a person with best conditions for thriving that should be met. And also kind of thinking about Yassi and the Xerox machines. Um, but the question is sort of what material objects, experiences, people, intangible things, restaurants, um, <laughs> been, you know, have been really uh, essential to your life as an artist. Wow. Wow. I mean, for me, the most, and this is just gonna sound so uh, obvious, but you know, the, good old Virginia Woolf. It's like, I need a studio. The studio is, and I, and I feel like I say this as somebody, I feel very lucky right now to have a really nice studio. Um, for many years, I've had strange and odd conditions to work in, but there's something, um, you know, it's, it's very simple. It's like very free. The idea of having a space in which you make something that is um, not useful in a kind of utilitarian way mm -hmm. is so interesting to me as someone who was raised in a family where everything had a purpose. So it's like, I love this idea that I can go to this place every day and make something that you know, doesn't chop wood, doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't have a function outside of a sort of philosophical or a communication of beauty or a communication of a bodily sensation set of ideas. Um, so that's, that's what I, but other than that, I think both Sheila and I, we live very modestly, like our studios are kind of the center of the universe. I just want to say, Carrie, whose studio are you in right now? I'm in your studio because See, mine is very hot and loud. Um, <laughs> and that, I say that because mine is a mess and lovely mess. And Carrie's is beautifully clean and very well <laughs> organized. I, um, yeah, I mean, this is, I've, I've worked for years without a studio, so it's all been a kind of bait and switch. Like I, this gallery, the museum or the gallery is my studio because I would knit and crochet or whatever at home and then come with stuff or ship stuff. So you could, so I could uh, fake it. Um, but Kara's right, like I, I bought a standing bandsaw because we have a long lease on a studio, which is unheard of like a miracle. Um, I think it's time and space and, um, and that I've so far gotten away with not doing anything that I think is um, real work. Um, and my companion and smartest friend, Carrie Moyer. I mean, I'm really, this doesn't happen without being able to go, come home and talk to somebody about the minutia that is actually understood. Like, I think that's, um, I just think that was it almost, it's strange that we found each other almost. So that the relationships are important. Um, and just, you know, it's like, I just want to have enough, just enough to keep the basic stuff. Like, so not being, um, I 
just a being, you know, when I was working at Pratt, somebody who was very important said, well, do you have any power? And I was like, I don't know. Do I have any power? I probably have power, but here's my view of power. Power is like pocket change. You get it, you spend it. You get it, you spend it. If you're, if you've got jars and jars of pocket change, you're in trouble. It's just going to weigh you down. It's not a good thing. Like the influence should be like water. Just keep going because all I want to do is maintain this thing. I don't want to live on, on Zoom for the rest of my life though. That would be my only big I would be very unhappy if I had to do Zoom forever. I'm very grateful. Thank you for this wonderful This has been amazing. Talk. It's you, Yossi, it's so much. And um, you, all you, I'm sorry, we love the guys, but this has been <laughs> like a little women's kind of confab, bo boiling, kind of witchy thing going on here. And I really enjoyed it. We're going to undercut it a little. <laughs> What's that? We're going to undercut it just a little. Um, oh, no. At the rail, we have a tradition of ending lunch with a poem. And we've That's um, good. been so happy. We've carried this into our community events. And today I'm thrilled to welcome the poet Rukhuswamat Dwebebi to the stage, the Zoom stage. Uh, before he reads for you, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him uh, right now. So, Viswamit Dwebebe is the author of, author of six collections of poetry, published in India and in the United States, mm. teaches comparative literature and English at the American University of Paris, and is the founder and editor of the New Press, a small press that publishes limited edition chapbooks from writers in India and elsewhere. Currently, he is working on a series of mixed genre books on medieval architecture in India, and a historical fiction work about immigrant life in early 19th century London. Um, Swamath, thank you so much for being here. Uh, take the mic. Let me... uh, thank you so much for having me. I hope everybody can hear me. And it was such a lovely conversation to hear. Um, there, is, there was so much talk about history and, you know, before um, the reading, I was like, oh, what am I going to read? Like, should I read something? Like, you know, I wrote something for like the pandemic and I was like, no. Um, but um, yeah, um, I've been working on this series of books that are, um, that take, it's kind of ecrastic writing. And I take um, these um, 12th century, 13th century temple um, clusters um, spread across India. And I go stay uh, there for a few days um, or a period of time and respond to, um, what I see and then do research. So I'm going to send, uh, I'm going to read a few poems, very short ones from um, the series that I'm going, um, that I've been working on, on a um, group of temples called Khajurao in India. Again, like 12th century, 13th century, they have a lot of erotic sculptures and, um, you know, uh, people go there on their honeymoon or like it's all couples and then to be in that space as a queer man and uh, be able to write looking at those sculptures was very interesting. So um, anyways, um, I'm just gonna, this is uh, from a book called um, Stone Throne. Um, okay, um, one, the guide didn't tell me much, but what pictures to take of a sunset people have been watching from here forever. The sun was just a flame back then, a missing forehead, which often stood for fate, which is the form the sandstone takes. I'll wait by the door for the sun to come up so you can see what a difference a date makes. You'll have none of that. We count back with half their faces missing, the other half refusing to turn away. No use of these photographs to remember. The temples refuse to stand in the background, are also made of sand, so the wind is not always a taking away, but carrying a story onward. Two, the terrorist group claims blame for the crash, but it's actually a technical failure, unlike one in this architecture, which is often a fault of the times. When the world went awry, they stood, uh, they stood renovated every couple of hundreds of hands. Only a quarter of the temple survive. We will have to reroute the maps, he said, then imagined three times as many dungeons right where the villages are built. Now the fuel prices are down. They couldn't survive their own eyes, or the eyes couldn't survive, 
seeing all that they did and are looking at us still. Everything here was once a lake. The water drank away its attraction to the sun and turned to stone. Hence a new name for the skeleton churn fine as sand. Sifted into what they say repeats are variations of the same scene, a comic strip, erotic, sculpted, scalopino, the sun god comes down to fill his lovers with hope are waiting still. And as a king might say, now I'm afraid I'll lose all this and does just because once every evening we are granted a wish. Three, they came here to learn about physical pleasures under the blessings of an entire family. She lies naked a millennia, a millennia later in a painting by Matisse. It could be anyone really under the sun during those days around these parts weren't meant to be hidden. What undulates on the skin tucked away in the plateau you might have to travel for days to come. She gets ready for him in phases. On the first night, the longing, the second, a tease. On the third, pressing herself close to may open what Krishna once called the gateway to heaven to quote sex and the city grows at every opportunity, a child for each time you say yes. Okay, I think I'll stop there. That was Thank so you sweet so you asked. Okay, is that enough? <laughs> um, those were so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing them. Thank you for uh, listening and for having me a part of this space. Yeah, I feel I feel like I'm I'm seeing all these connections that are sort of like like subterranean even. Um, thank you so much, Sheila. Thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, thank you, Yassi. Um, Fantastic. Thank you. Everybody. I love. Uh, I think poetry. everyone should be able to turn on their microphones and say goodbye as we thank exit. You, Sheila, Carrie. Thank, Thank you, you, Carrie. Thank, Thank you, you, Sheila. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can we stay on for yeah. a minute? Okay. Thank you, Sheila. Thank, Thank, you. So Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks, Sheila. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you.